Support for this podcast and the following message come from Broadway in Fort Lauderdale. Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, based on the 2015 Tony Award winning production, is breathtaking and exquisite, says the New York Times. November 20th through December 2nd. Tickets at BrowardCenter.org. Welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich, also starring Sean Comer. Hope you're ready, Hollywood, because you're On Trial. All rise. The Honorable Judge Fudge presiding. This is On Trial, brought to you by the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, one of your hosts, and in this case, I'm your uh, defense attorney, Mr... No, I'm prosecuting. Wait, yeah, prosecuting. Yeah, I'm your prosecuting attorney, <laughs> Mr. Mark Rattledge. On the docket for tonight is Halloween 2, uh, 1981 feature, the sequel to the 1978 John Carpenter film, uh, Halloween. This is, of course, the slasher, uh, f- the slasher feature that brought us Hollywood horror Halloween icon Michael Myers, otherwise known as The Shape. Uh, with me tonight, doing his defense duties, is Mr. Sean Comer. How do you do, sir? Miles Edgeworth for the defense, your judginess. All right, you picked it. For God, yep. God's sakes, Why? uh well your honor it's because so it's so weird that we're mixing up court terms you're the prosecution i'm calling you your honor um (laughs) uh the reason i picked it is because number one uh just flat out shrewd seo because the new halloween sequel just premiered recently and you know, we want to we want to kind of jump on that popularity bandwagon, but yeah, also because it's one of those, it's one of the Halloween movies that just never gets talked about all that often. It's it, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle of I think not being so obstinately bad that it gets either thoroughly maligned or poked fun at, and yet it it falls. And yet it it falls so short of living up to the original that there just there just isn't much good that people really have to say about it in terms of it being especially memorable. And yet, and yet of of all the movies, and keep in mind I have not seen the new one yet, so I can't really include that in this opinion. I didn't think it was that bad. In fact, I really thought it was pretty good. Um, uh, critics utterly savaged it. I think it's it, it currently sits at somewhere thirty percent. I believe it's around yeah around a thirty percent on Rotten Tomatoes based on thirty seven reviews. But th- that strikes me as a rating that implies it's just utterly offensive to all sensibilities, and I, I think as as Halloween movies go, or just as general slasher movies go, it's it's not bad. <laughs> it ain't half bad, yeah, I mean, but it ain't it's, half it's, good, neither. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, but it's one of those that um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going out and, and seeking it out immediately. Like, it's not a must-see. But at the same time, it's one of those that if I were surfing through the cable channels and I happen to find find it on, yeah, I'd, I'd probably sit down with a beer and watch it. Uh, why don't you give us just a few minutes of notes on uh, the production of this and then I'll jump into what I can what I can possibly stitch together as a plot synopsis. <laughs> well, the short version of short version of it is that John Carpenter didn't want to be especially closely involved in it despite uh, he and original co-producer Deborah Hill 
uh, co-writing the screenplay. And in fact, he flat out declined to direct, and instead he handed it off to uh, young, unproven director Rick Rosenthal. Um, and the Rosenthal, to his credit, he did a fine job reproducing most of the first film's key elements: uh, the first-person camera perspectives, a lot, of, a lot of the mood, uh, the the. A tense, suspenseful kind of tenor of it. But he also added his own much more much more graphic means of kind of raising the stakes. Um, the, the entire thing was shot in uh, 1981, mostly at Los Angeles' Morningside Hospital, a uh, once more on a pretty scant budget, about two point five million dollars, but which I believe was still more money than the first one had to work with. Um, overall, it did well at the box office. I mean, it made over based on that budget, it made over twenty five million domestically. Um, as I said, critics absolutely savaged it, who felt that it was unnecessarily over the top, violent and gory compared to Carpenter being much more restrained in the original. Uh, it was meant to be the last movie to feature Michael Myers after introducing the plot twist that Lori was Michael's sister. And it was also the last to revolve around the town of Haddonfield. But <laughs> then... I'm sorry, go ahead. But then, as we discussed on the show before, they... I'm sorry? Go ahead. I was going to say. Um, but then, as we discussed on a previous episode, uh, they made, they envisioned Halloween 3 Season of the Witch as the beginning of an anthology series that would tell a different story each year that just happened to center on October, 30, on October 31st. Audiences weren't really biting they didn't go for it. Everybody was disappointed that there was no connection to Michael and Lori and Dr. Loomis. So uh, six years after Season of the Witch uh, debuted in 1982, they brought Michael back in The Return of Michael Myers in 1988, and that resulted in a trio of god-awful sequels until they which were eventually retconned with Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection. And that's kind of the key stuff to remember as far as the trivia is concerned. All right, so let's let's jump right in here. Uh, our movie, much like Rocky and Rocky 2, our movie takes place minutes later uh, after the first one. We actually get a few. We actually get the ending sequence to the first one. We have Laurie Strode telling the kids, "You know, run, run, run like hell." Um, we have the final confrontation between Mike Myers and Laurie Strode in the closet, where he gets poked in the eye. Uh, Loomis comes in, shoots him. He falls off the uh, he falls off the balcony, hits the ground. Loomis goes back out to, to to make sure that he's really dead, and of course, Michael has gone into the night. Uh, from there, we, we, we pick it up where, um, you know, Loomis is trying to get the police to come, the, the local sheriff's office. Uh, Laurie is being carried out of the house in an ambulance to the hospital. And Mike Myers is trying to wave off the six gunshots to the body and the blinding of the eye. You know, because apparently Mike Myers is fucking Deadpool. Anywho, um, <laughs> Jesus Christ, this movie... So, as Deadpool, I mean, Mike Myers proceeds to, uh, you know, convalesce. He goes about require. He goes about getting a new weapon, like you would do in an, in an RPG. You know, okay, I'm not going to do the Winfrey thing where I'm going to keep making jokes. Ah, I can do this. I can get through this without continually <laughs> making cracks. <laughs> I'm, uh, are you okay? Do you need a moment, Mark? <laughs> oh, I'm going to. I'm going to shake this off. Um, I, I'll. I'll <laughs> I'll save the I'll save the wise cracking for uh, for my prosecuting. Um, all right, so he goes and gets himself a new weapon. He leaves the old lady and the man um, 
alone, just proceeds to bleed on his bologna sandwich. Um, he then he, he's in next door to the old lady, and the in the in the asleep husband is a teenage girl, and Mike Myers remembers, hey, I hate teenage girls, and proceeds to kill her. And we move on from that scene. Uh, we get to the hospital. We're introduced to the paramedic who was the lead in the last Starfighter. Uh, a bunch of random nurses, a doctor. Uh, that's about it, from what I remember. Oh, and a, and a security guard. Um, Mike Myers proceeds to uh, walk through town. He happens to hear that Lori is at the hospital and then remembers, hey, wait a minute, I have a job I hadn't finished. So he goes to the hospital to finish off Lori. Uh, he kills the he kills the security guard with a hammer. Thinking ahead, he also takes out all the cars. He <laughs> he flattens the tires. He's you know he he cuts the um, I want to say he he uh, disables the car so they can't start. Uh, for, for cutting like the fuel injection line prop, I would assume. Uh, so he takes out all the cars so nobody can can nobody can drive away, and he go you know he then he cuts the telephone uh, service from the hospital so nobody can call out. All right, so now he's got a bunch of victims in a place that he can proceed to hack and slash through. Meanwhile, Loomis is on the hunt. Uh, He finds out that the sheriff that he's working with finds out that his daughter Annie was one of the victims from the first movie, so he takes off and leaves one of the other deputies in charge. They continue to drive around town. Eventually, Loomis is told, hey, you are being recalled back to the state hospital. You can't be here. This this is a big mess. Um, and at that time, he's told, oh, and by the way, Laurie Strode is Mike Myers' actual biological sister. Dun, dun, dun. At which point, he hijacks the state trooper's car and, and makes him drive him back to the hospital. While all that's happening, uh, Mike Myers kills the security guard Kills the bunch of the nurses. Uh, the last starfighter slips in a pool of blood and knocks himself unconscious. Laurie Strode eventually gets out of bed. That was mostly what she did through this movie was kind of laying in bed and like half, you know, be half asleep or catatonic. But eventually she got out of bed. And she runs into the parking lot. Mike Myers eventually follows her out there. Um, uh, Loomis... Uh, eventually makes it back to the hospital. They, they they let Laurie back inside. Mike Myers comes in like Stone Cold Steve Austin through through a plate glass window. <laughs> a la WrestleMania 13. Take a drink. Um, they proceed to shoot him that <laughs> six more times, and he uses his mutant powers to regenerate. And he chases him down the hallway. Uh, they lock him in the room. Laurie shoots him twice in the eyes. He stabs Dr. Loomis. Uh, they lock him in the room, and Loomis blows the place up. Uh, Lori is the, and then daylight breaks, and Lori is then escorted from that hospital to another hospital as she has visions of him uh, burning, burning alive. <sighs> this fucking movie. All right. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Let me first say that I think... If this were damn you Hollywood, I would I would disagree with the critics. I feel like a lot of them were doing a lot of pearl clutching, like oh my god, the gore was amped up. Mm. Yes. Maybe maybe I'm looking at it in 2018 eyes when we have movies like Hostel and um what's the other the big the famous one uh where Saw, j- j- Saw yeah. Or you have movies like Hostel and Saw out there that, you know, that, that, or, you know, even, you know, in that era, you had the Nightmare on Elm Street series, which, you know, if you want gore, you need some, Nan- you know, what was it, Nancy or whoever, who was being tossed around the room with blood everywhere, you know, or people, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, people being mean into puppets with their veins. Yuck. Um, oh, that's the, that, that still squicks me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can't watch that scene. That still grosses me I, you you know me when it comes to horror. I've got mm-hmm. a strong stomach, and that's that's one of the rare ones where something about that whole concept. Ugh, oh, so, that, that used to me right, and and so you're making my point for me. That, like if, if you really compare the worst possible kill in Halloween two to any of the kills in A Nightmare on Elm Street, 
which would which one we could say is its contemporary. You know, the first at least four Nightmare on Elm Street were around the same time as the Halloween movies. Um, it, it, they don't compare. It, this, it's tame by comparison. So I think, you know, like, oh, we really amped up the gore here. You know, I, I, I don't think really properly describes the movie, and I don't think it's a good criticism. What is a good criticism is that you don't have any interesting kills here. Even the one where he drowns the girl in the, in the therapy tub, you know, it's like, meh. I was really expecting that to be a lot more gross. Than, than it ended up being. I thought, you know, there was a missed opportunity there to really scare the shit out of people with, you know, some, 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 a, a burn victim. But they, th- that, there's nothing, there are no characters in this movie, number one. Even Laurie Strode lacks any kind of character. She's essentially just, a, just a dame running from a monster. That's it. And 90% of the movie, she does absolutely nothing. And when she finally does do something, it's run like hell. That's it. Okay? To the very last... I think it was one critic, unless I did agree with, that she doesn't survive by any kind of planning or any kind of ingenuity or, you know, outsmarting the monster. She was handed a gun, she shot him in the eyes, then she ran for it, while the real hero of the picture, old crazy bastard Loomis, sets the place ablaze, taking him and Michael with him. Um, Taking Michael with him. So... That's my first major criticism of this, is that you have to have one or the other. If you lack both, then you have no movie. You either have to have really gruesome, interesting kills, or you have to have characters that you either want to see beheaded by the monster, you know, old Reggie the Reckless. You know, you want to see these people... Like, you know, the first Halloween, at least you had the two asshole friends who were like, yeah, good, I don't mind, this. I don't mind seeing them get killed. You know, totally. I totally didn't mind seeing them killed. Totally. <laughs> um, you know, and Annie was an asshole. So, you know, the fact that she finally gets it when she does, that's fine. That's all well and good. You know, and Laurie Strode was the nice one, and you wanted her to live through the whole thing, right? Right. So so here comes Halloween 2, and, you know, the last Starfighter's a little creepy, okay? He's... I don't know why he suddenly fell in love with Laurie, but, you know, other than, and they don't do anything with it, really. He just suddenly falls in love with her for no good reason, and then doesn't really do anything for the rest of the movie except <laughs> comedically slip and fall <laughs> in a puddle of blood, which looked like red paint. Um, so there's that. So you don't have characters, and... You don't care if any of these people get killed. They're not bad enough that you want to see them die. They're not good enough that you're rooting for them to, to, to succeed and live. They're just cannon fodder. Which then brings you to the other thing. Then if you kill them, you have to make it look really cool. You have to do interesting things with it. You have to produce a scare that is you know worthy of the term horror. So let's walk through these, okay? You've got the security guard who takes a hammer to the head. Uh, after the initial jump scare, which we all know what a pansy I am, and I didn't even jump. Um, so he takes a hammer to the head, and later on he'll be strung up somewhere. Eh, yawn. Like, now let's move on to the next one. Um, you've got the the lecherous paramedic who gets strangled. Meh. You've got his girlfriend nurse who shows up late to work all the time, uh, who <laughs> who gets drowned and scalded in the therapy tub. Again, I mentioned it before, a missed opportunity for something truly gross. Um, again, not particularly interesting. Uh, you've got the one black nurse that got bled out. Meh. And, no, then, then, then you have Pike, quite possibly the best kill of the entire movie, is when he stabs the one nurse and lifts her off the ground, and her shoes fall. And, it, and I laughed when the shoes fell. Not really what you want to produce in that moment is laughter, but I did. I laughed. I thought it was funny. I thought the shoes had really good comedic timing. So so he lifts her up in the air and drops her, and that's the end of that. Um, again, kind of blah. Kind of... It, it, it comes across, and again, maybe I'm unfairly looking at it with 2018 eyes, but I, I really tried to put myself back in the, you know, in the dog day afternoons of the 70s, and I... St- Still feel like this is this comes across like a B movie, a pale imitation of the first Halloween. 
this this is this is like one of those you know it, it, the real movie was Transformers and then somewhere on a Netflix out there was Transmorphers. This feels like Transmorphers. Um, I, I mentioned before they didn't really give Jamie Lee Curtis enough to do to, to warrant her being back, and it's almost to the point where why bother having her? I mean, granted for continuity's sake, sure. Um, and it's not like at that time she was getting a lot of roles, but I. She was wait. She's utterly wasted. Jamie Lee Curtis is a good actress, and she's wasted in this. They 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 could have gotten away with a mannequin for for what she did, and a stunt double. Um, that's about it. It, I feel like as a horror movie, this fails on most levels, and I could get into the whole you know. <laughs> Michael Myers' Deadpool, you know, with regeneration powers thing that he should have been, that he should have never made it out of the first movie, let alone as far as he makes it in this movie. But it's a horror movie. All even though they don't do anything with the fact that you know that he, it's just sort of a plot device that he's super powerful and can absorb you know a, you know a ridiculous amount of punishment. Could I rip that apart? Sure. But again, you have to make certain uh, you have to make certain uh, allowances in a horror movie for that sort of thing, or you've got nothing. Um, that is until the Scream movies came along and produced two perfectly normal human beings who were able to make it look like they were supernatural. Your witness, sir. The problem too often in almost any fictional medium when you're making a follow-up is that you don't want to get too far from what people loved about the original, but at the same time, you want to give them something fresh. I have to give Halloween 2 credit. For better and sometimes for worse, it indeed manages to strike somewhat of a balance between those two. Rosenthal stepped in as director and he did his best to live up to the style of suspense that John Carpenter had previously crafted. Now, what happened later was Carpenter was asked to step in to perhaps touch the movie up a little bit. And in fact, Rosenthal would later complain that the amount of gore and nudity that Carpenter's changes later added actually took away from the pacing that he had in mind. So, had this turned into more Rosenthal's project rather than something that was more of uh, an indirect collaboration between Rosenthal and and Carpenter in terms of actual production, who knows? We might have gotten an entirely different movie. But at the same time, we continue the theme of Michael clearly being obsessed with obsessed with Lori and being willing to take out anybody in his path to get to her, which is good. That would set up the entire rest of the franchise, including the movie that we just most recently got. At the same time, the prosecution has a point that the cannon fodder characters, so to speak, are not really remotely as interesting as they were in Carpenter's acclaimed original. No, I'll grant that. They're not. Uh, For one thing, we don't get quite as much much time with them as we did in places in the first movie, wherein we at least got to establish them a little bit. You know, while Myers is still on the still on the loose, stalking Lori, and as a result, we get to see Lori interacting with the people who would eventually be sliced, be sliced, diced, gutted, hung, etc. Uh, during the second and third acts, so that's a fair point. I I will grant I will grant that much, but. At the same time, in my opinion, it kind of works thematically, you know, because it's focused more on what is now strictly a game of amped up stakes raised cat and mouse between Michael and between Michael and Laurie because Laurie has tried to kill him and nearly succeeded. She thwarted she thwarted him and got away. 
So to a certain extent, given that Michael is theoretically, as we're, as Dr. Loomis so often implies, supposed to be the embodiment of all pure evil, uh, he's now pissed as fuck and hell-bent for leather. So, of course, so of course, he's not going to be quite as methodical this time this time I'm out. No. Instead, he's going to be just angry just angry as fuck and just taking people out left, right, and sideways in the most savage ways he possibly can if it gets them out of the way just a little bit quicker so that he can go so that he can go and perforate Laurie Stroh's torso. And you know, I gotta admit, credit where it's where it's due, the setting also works because yeah in the first movie it's most of the kills happen in uh you know shadowy empty quiet houses and you know that has its own chilling ambiance but let's face it there are few environments that are just quite as <clears throat> quite as naturally unsettling as a hospital so, I mean, what you can do there with all the long corridors and the lighting and some of the sha- and some of the shadows, in some way, some of the settings are, I, I would argue, at least as effective, potentially, as some of the shots of the first of the first movie, even if they aren't quite as subtle, even if they aren't quite as drawn out, it works in its own way. Um, there's the whole the whole notion was brought up that nobody really bothers to outsmart or or outplan Michael, um, according to some critics. And frankly, in a way, I think even uh, even that kind of works to the movie's benefit because really, when you're trying to outsmart somebody, you're trying to sometimes pretend that they're thinking like a relatable human being which we've already established Michael isn't you know he's just a rampaging soulless remorseless killing machine so how do you plan for that how do you outsmart that when you can't when few human beings can really put themselves into that into that frame of mind into that state it's just not something that comes naturally to most people. So it makes sense that people would be kind of caught up, would be kind of caught off guard because, I mean, you just can't. You, you just can't predict. Just can't predict kind of an entity that that behaves in that way. Let's move on to the kills themselves and the notion that they're uninteresting. I don't know about that. Um, I think that stepping them up and ramping up the gore and the violence was necessary. Because, again, you don't want to make the exact same movie twice, which is what Carpenter has conceded in the intervening years he was afraid of while writing this movie was yeah, he was trying to find a way by any stretch to simply not remake Halloween. So you can't simply have just Michael walking around with a butcher knife. You you have to give the audience some the audience something different if this is going to succeed at all. And given the box office grosses, you could argue that it certainly worked. I mean, you put him in you put him in different surroundings, and he's going to find different tools of the trade to get the job done. You know, he find he finds a tub full of scalding water. Oh, okay, that okay, that'll work, Dunkaroo. Um, you know, he can find scalpels, hypodermic hypodermic needles, windows to jump through. I mean, Michael has never exactly been Jason been Jason Voorhees. He's never been quite that savage, but he's a stalking killer. 
and so he makes he makes excellent use of what's of what's around him to take out his prey and you have to kind of appreciate that yeah maybe it's not as maybe it's not quite as mind bending and stylized and innovative as a nightmare on elm street would be uh some 3 years later when it came when it came out but still it was a bit of an evolution of the killer because he was all of a sudden all of a sudden in a whole new world with the same objective and new prey um so i just didn't take quite take quite the issue with kind of the the ramped up sex and violence like most critics did it didn't quite go in the over the top direction of friday the 13th um it was i would still argue a lot smarter than mo- than most slasher movies of the time were and you can chalk a lot of that up to the fact that John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were still involved involved in writing this and that Rosenthal appreciated enough of their style to want to carry that to carry that over so is it a perfect slasher no hell no far from it i would even argue there are probably at least a dozen better ones that you could that you could watch but I would say that the aggregate thirty percent thirty percent rating that it freshness that it has on Rotten Tomatoes is is far 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 too harsh for what is definitely a better first effort than most first time horror directors ever achieve. I'll turn it over to you to close it out. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean. Here, here's the thing with what the defense has said. He talks about the setting. I absolutely agree with him. I think the setting was a really great place to to do a Halloween sequel. It certainly follows in the logic of things. I just thought it was wasted. I thought there. I thought if you're going to do it in a hospital, there's so much more you can so much more you can do. So many more interesting ways to kill a guy in a hospital setting than what they chose to go with. See, see, I think that's my biggest issue with Halloween, too, is that there was a lot of potential to do some really scary, interesting, and gross things, and a lot of it gets wasted, and the one criticism I saw on Rotten Tomatoes that I agreed with was that it was really pedestrian and predictable. Um, I, mean, I don't so much care about the predictable part, but I, I think if you're... I think we can all agree that the story was told in the, in the first Halloween that you know barring economic concerns you know and the opportunity to make mo- to make more money nobody needed another Halloween movie and nobody was nobody was sitting there asking questions like well what what happens <laughs> next to Laurie Strode and Mike Myers no, nobody cared um but obviously People, people liked it. People are attached to these characters, and you know. And if Hollywood decides they're gonna do more movies with them, people will obviously go out and see them. At, you know, as the franchise has shown, even when they make terrible movies. Um, so, with that being said, I, I think if you're gonna do a sequel, you really do have to turn it up a notch. And I don't feel like this does. I feel like, I, I think the director felt. That he was hamstrung by this by the tone of the first movie and needing to keep it consistent. To that, I would argue, and granted, it's not the next day or anything like this one is, but you have Terminator, which had it had its own tone. That was a slasher movie by and large. Just the the monster is a, is a robot from the future, and then you had Terminator Two. Which was an which was a big budget action adventure movie. Two completely different tones, two completely different takes on the character. When one you know in the in the original he's a horror monster, and in the second he's a superhero, by and large. In the first one, there were some there were some themes about destiny and whatever, but I mean for the most part it was run from the monster. In the second one, they really dealt with. You know, with 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 the theme of choice and destiny, and 
you know, and all of that. And Terminator Two really does stand on its own as a as a different movie than Terminator One. You know, you could laugh probably live without seeing the first Terminator, and you get all that you need out of Terminator Two. And I'm pitching that that's what they needed to do with Halloween Two, was that if you that you could in fact continue that same night, but you don't have to. I mean. Why can't why can't Laurie you know weeks later no one's seen Michael Myers? Laurie's still in the hospital. As a matter of fact, she's no longer in the ICU or or, or whatever. But she's in the psych wing. Now you've got a lot of grist for the mill here. And this is what I'm saying. I'm just I'm just spitballing a few ideas that I was thinking about as the, as the defense was put put for put for put putting out there his <laughs> argument. Ugh. Um <laughs> Putting forth, <laughs> there we go. Putting forth his argument, but even if you're like, mm, you know, let's take some of what I've thrown out there and work it a different way. My point is, you take your base and take it, take it somewhere far out there. Don't settle for. Don't you know? Don't feel like, eh, let's keep it in the box. We don't go want to go too far outside the box. I know then the, the, the counter to that is, yeah, but Season of the Witch. Season of the Witch doesn't go outside the box. Season of the Witch takes the box, sets it, sets it on fire, and goes and gets a new box, okay? I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I get frustration on both sides of that argument, by the way. Because here's, cause here's the people. We want Laurie Strode. We want Micah Myers. Don't do nothing different. <laughs> we want what we want. <laughs> and John Carpenter going, but I'm an artist. I want to do different things. I want to paint in many colors. And then we're going, we're just rabble. We don't care. You know, I get I, I get all that. Screw your colors. Give us puppies playing poker. That's right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> fuck art. Let's kill. You know, I get that. I totally do. Um, so, but I, I think there is an argument for going far outside the box, but still keeping it at least in the arena that is Halloween as set forth in the first movie, um, that's really all I have to say about this. It's, it's you know, it's it's just bland. It's it's a bland movie with bland kills, and it doesn't do anything that the first movie didn't do much better to begin with. It's hard to imagine these are going to get worse, by the way, um, but apparently they do. Apparently they apparently the the, the next couple of Michael My- Night- Halloween movies get much worse. Though I can't tell you, I've seen. Four or, five, four or five or six. I have seen H2O, and if I'm remembering, people are telling me H2O is better than I remember it being. I remember H2O being a pile of trash. Uh, uh, no, Resurrection was a pile of trash. I'm try- I, I feel like I saw the one with LL Cool J, that's H2O, but I also feel like I saw the one with Busta Rhymes. Or is that the same movie? Um, no, LL Cool J was in H2O, Busta Rhymes was in Resurrection. Maybe I saw a resurrection, and then and that was the pile of shit that I'm remembering. Uh, well, let, well, let's see here. Um, H2O is the one that is set with Lori being the uh, headmaster of a private school. Uh, Josh Hartnett is Josh Hartnett is her son. He he goes there. LL Cool J is the security guard, and Michael somehow tracks her down, and poof. Her big hidden past is all of a sudden brought to light. Um, Resurrection is the one that opens with Michael tracking Lori down in an insane asylum, killing her, and then murdering uh, the people who were trying to film an online reality show in his old house. That might have been the one that I saw, because I remember I went to the movie theater to see one with my friends, and it was cut, it was edited uh-huh. poorly. The the just nothing about it was good, and I remember Busta Rhymes being really funny. Like that would be that if it was if Busta was in it, then that would be Resurrection because H two O, while not my favorite, was really better than it had any right being. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's it. Anything? Uh, I think we're good here. Any, anything else you want to say, or are we ready to wrap? If you ever think about complaining this again, if you ever give it so much as a thought before you say a single goddamn word go and watch the three movies that preceded Halloween H2O <laughs> I swear to God this will 
this will look like The Shining by comparison. <laughs> Okay, so I, I I have to sit and watch Halloween's four, five, and six. Knowing what a pansy you are when it comes to horror movies, I will not say that I recommend it, but I will say that if you ever want a whole new appreciation for every good for every good sequel that uh, came after the original movie, yeah, watch those three and realize that. Oh, Marky Moo, it gets so, 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 so very much worse than this. And then there's the Rob Zombie ones, which I will never watch. Uh, the first one was a good slasher movie that should have just never been branded as a Halloween movie. That's fair. All right. Well, that pretty much closes the book on this season of Halloween here at the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network. Tonight, the Metal Hammer of Doom will review Trick or Treat reanimated. And then tomorrow is November 1st, and we will be recording a commentary track for the uh, 1990 movie Spaced Invaders with uh, Justin Thomas, uh, Jesse Starcher, Ronnie Adams, I believe, will be on. And uh, we'll be doing that in celebration of the anniversary of the War of the Worlds broadcast. As for when the next on trial is, well, well we got a Robin Hood week coming up at the very end of November. Um, well, we, source material will be doing Hawkeye, Volume 1, My Life as a Weapon. We'll be doing Damn You Hollywood for the new Robin Hood movie that looks like a piece of trash. Uh, and then on Thursday, November 29th, we'll be doing on trial Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with... Um, Oh, gosh. Superman's dad. What the fuck's his name again? <laughs> Marlon Brando? No, the other one. Uh, Russell Crowe? No, Prince of Thieves. You, God, who's in Prince of Thieves? Um, Kevin Costner. There Alan we Rickman. go. Kevin Costner. Um, oh, that's... Oh, okay. I was thinking I was thinking of Kal-El's dad. No. <laughs> no, the one of them that wanted... The one that wanted to watch a bus full of children drown. That one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was I was thinking of the wrong super daddy. Uh, yes, we'll be doing an on trial for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Sean will be prosecuting. I will be defending. Um, shortly after that, we will be doing. In fact, the week after that, December sixth, we will be doing an an on trial for Rocky Four, the movie that ended communism. Sean will be prosecuting. I will be defending. Uh, and then we close up the 2018 on trial docket with uh, Jingle All the Way, that Arnold Schwarzenegger holiday classic, uh, where Sean will be, where I will be prosecuting and Sean will be defending. Lots of luck there. Oh, it's an easy one to defend. <laughs> so easy. Um, all right, that's it for me and plugs. Quick, do your thing, and then we'll get on out of here. Okay, well, I've only got one major thing that I need to plug, and that is uh, this coming Saturday is Extra Life Saturday. That means that over at twitch.tv slash Comer Codex, C-O-M-E-R-C-O-D-E-X, I am going to be playing video games live for 24 straight hours from 9 a.m. Central Time Saturday until 9 a.m. Central Time on Sunday to raise money for Children's Miracle Network. Um, we are going to be starting off with uh, my playing a few hours of Dead by Daylight as kind of a little bit of a belated Halloween hangover. Uh, we're going to then... I'm going to then run all 10 of my Overwatch uh, Season 13 competitive placement matches, which... Should be kind of fun, especially since I'm going to be solo queuing and God only knows what I'm going to get for teammates. Uh, let's see what else. And then the rest of the day is going to be a little bit of a wild card, but so far what I do know, uh, if I don't finish it before then, I am going to be finishing up the last little stretch of Undertale that I haven't played yet. And then I'm thinking... I'm really seriously thinking that we mend the entire day either marathoning the first three Uncharted games or the first three or the Bioshock trilogy. Uh, but I've also got a few other surprises I can pull out, some stuff that I haven't played yet. I've got Fallout 4, which I've been meaning to get to for ages, Batman Arkham Knight, which I'm ashamed to say I haven't dug into yet. All kinds of stuff. But most importantly, uh, tune in, donate some money, 
watch me play watch me play games and probably snark, joke, have fun and die a lot. And but you know, best of all, help some sick kids. Help sick kids and their families out. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sean, for participating. We will see you in about a month for Robin Hood. Be well, be safe, and behave. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Broadway in Fort Lauderdale. Two worlds collide in Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, hailed as breathtaking and exquisite by the New York Times. The musical is based on the 2015 Tony Award-winning Lincoln Center Theater production. The King and I boasts a score that features such beloved classics as Getting to Know You, Something Wonderful, and Shall We Dance. Don't miss The King and I at the Broward Center, November 20th through December 2nd. Tickets at BrowardCenter.org.